Thanks a lot, Andrew. It's really been my pleasure to spend the last two days here. Um, and really, the 20 odd years have been odd years being in the United States. I've been from coast to coast uh, and top to bottom and experienced a big difference. And one of the things that's been, uh, I think, very unique has been experience in American healthcare, both as a patient and providing he uh, healthcare. Uh, and clearly, uh, uh, medicine is changing in the United States. And one of the reasons I chose this topic was that I felt that. Um, we have problems because of the way healthcare is provided in the United States. And this is a unique group of patients that um, we really didn't get out of the pediatric uh, shackles uh, ever. They would stay, I remember in Boston, we would have patients who were 40 years old on the ward with spina bifida or extrophy, and they were in the children's hospital. That's where they had received all their care, and it's just not something that's possible anymore. So what I'd like to do is just start a little bit um, discussing the transition and the problems with transition of care, whether it be a urology patient or any other patient for that matter, in the American system. And I'd love to hear your comments afterwards as to how you do it uh, in Canada. And then look at one problem in particular, and that's the abnormal pediatric bladder, the patients with extra feed neurogenic bladders and bowels. So basically, when we look at uh, 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 transition or change, it's part of the aging uh, process. It's happening internally, it's happening externally, it's happening at the cellular level. And basically it's something we all have to accept. There's also the psychological aspects of change. When we talk about it in uh, a medical situation, however, especially uh, with, with the pediatric population, it's been defined as the purposeful planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems. So transition, in my opinion, does not equal transfer, and we have to understand that. We can't just parcel out the care completely from our own pediatric institutions, which have play therapists and have been nurturing, and all of a sudden transfer them to adult populations, especially in the American system. So it's a difficult situation because many of the kids we deal with, especially the spina bifida uh, patients, have been coddled their whole lives, and many of them may have IQ deficits that don't allow them to be self-sufficient uh, either. So part of transitioning is we have to understand how the patient here herself um, uh, understands and accepts the process. And this becomes uh, an educational process, which hopefully allows some degree of responsibility and ultimately uh, independence. So when we think of the process from top to bottom, the hope is that by having a, um, a well-oiled system that one can uh, improve or increase the likelihood of continuity of care, increase patient compliance, and hopefully improve uh, advocacy and self-advocacy. So if we take a look at the examples that we're going to discuss uh, in a few minutes, it, the groups in particular that, that had problems uh, transitioning in the past were the spina uh, bifida patients. And when I was in medical school, less than a third of them made it out of the nursery, yet alone making it to the age of 20. Today, more than 80% of patients are making it uh, into their young adult years, and the question is for how long are they going to go and what are the problems that we're going to see that we don't foresee right now 20 years for, uh, beyond that. Likewise, uh, the bladder extrophy uh, patients, especially with improved bladder function, there's still the psychosexual issues and everything else, and I have a patient that I'm taking care of now who had his extrophy closed 22 years ago at Hopkins, had a supposedly beautifully balanced uh, bladder, and knocked off his kidneys, went from a perfect ultrasound two years ago uh, to shot kidneys uh, over a period of two years. So the reality is uh, these are patients that we sometimes think are fixed, and they're not fixed. We have to follow them uh, for years and years and years. And of course, we can't be the, the policemen all the time either. They, they have to take some responsibility, and that's why transitioning is so important. So certainly in the beginning, family support is important, um, but we have to transition that change from the parents making the decision to ultimately the patient, he or herself, making decisions. Uh, there has to be professional sensitivity from our, our viewpoint, 
And again, a lot of adult providers aren't necessarily in the same mindset as what a pediatric specialist might be. They look at the patient differently and they sort of expect a 26-year-old to act like a 26-year-old. It's very different when someone's had a lifelong disability. We have to think of some of the other issues and some of the things that Larry Goldenberg, for instance, is starting to emphasize in men's health. We have to start thinking about some of the primary and preventative issues that are going to be necessary when we look at patients with uh, chronic disease and provide overall health education. So in the United States, and I'm not sure what it's like in Canada, we have upper age limits in most children's hospitals now. So it's driven primarily by anesthesia, and uh, anesthesiologists, at least in our system, don't want to take care of patients over the age of 18 and maybe as high as 21. There's issues pertaining to insurance coverage and reimbursement. And then when you look at a patient, for instance, with spina bifida who has uh, multiple system abnormalities, you need the interest of uh, various specialists in order to, pro to provide uh, total care. And adult hospitals aren't necessarily set up with a spina bifida clinic to have multiple surgeons and, and medical physicians working together that allow organization of care, communication, and involve the family. So when we look at the a children's hospital perspective, uh, it can be very uh, inconsistent within the specialties and even within departments and providers themselves. So I may have a different bias as to how I treat a spina bifida patient compared to my uh, other faculty members. The referrals sometimes are erratic. Patients are coming from all over the region, so you're probably taking care of all the spina bifs for the whole province. Um, and we have to be able to communicate, and certainly today in the days of Blackberries and iPhones and everything else, we're, we're able to do so much more efficiently than we could five years ago, evenly. Uh, I think the issues of psychological support are really an issue in the United States because it's not paid for. So once you get beyond a certain age, uh, we're dealing with real complex kids who are now realizing, hey, I can't walk. Sexually, I'm not the same as the other guy in my high school. And it's a real issue when, when they're trying to discover self. And there's also institutional barriers to integrating care. From the general hospital uh, uh, perspective, it's even more difficult because of the lack of, of structure and the individualism that's often present. And it's an unfamiliar system for many of the patients with very little ha uh, hand-holding. So it's going to be a real challenge, I think, in the United States for the adult institutions to embrace uh, many of these uh, patients. Well, how do you finance it? I mean, nowadays, probably with the new Obama player, uh, plan, uh, dependents will be able to be covered up to the age of 27 instead of the age of 21. But still, that doesn't take care of a lot of these issues, especially as, as life is extended in many of these patients. And we do have federal health care in the name of Medicare for patients who have chronic disabilities. And for those who don't qualify, uh, there's state uh, uh, indigent support uh, in the name of uh, Medicaid. But there's plenty of barriers because once you get employed, you lose the benefits of Medicare or Medicaid. So if we're trying to improve the whole gestalt and quality of life for these patients and they're getting employed, especially in menial jobs, all of a sudden they can't afford health insurance and they've lost the ability uh, to be covered by Medicare or Medicaid. And even if they do get a good job, they've got a pre-existing condition. So many of the insurance companies won't be covering them for their health care. So it's, it's, I hate to use the word corrupt, but it's uh, a fairly corrupt system when one looks at it. So health insurance, as I said, there's variable uh, limits, much dependent on the employer because a lot of the insurance it, it, that we pay for is not paid totally by ourselves. It's paid by our institution. Uh, as a matter of fact, the majority is paid for by our institution. Otherwise, it would cost a fortune for us. Um, and they lose the dependent status. So Medicare is a safety net for many of the disabled as long as they're not working and in a, a position where they can uh, uh, capture their uh, own insurance. So this is going to be very problematic, and it's going to be something that really wasn't discussed uh, in Congress when they, they were um, arguing the uh, health care system. So nothing is per, uh, uh, perfect. There's no evidential uh, basis for what uh, really works. And I think health care, as we're learning in the States and probably even in Canada now, uh, 
we're going to break our banks in both nations the way things are going and it's a moving target and we're unfortunately the victims in many cases because we're not terribly united in providing our own voices at least in the states so what we have to do at least at the grassroots level is establish hospital to hospital transition programs that incorporates all of the departments and specialties that are necessary for some of these uh, complex patients I don't know how fiscally we're going to be able to do it because we're losing social workers left and right, but we need to involve social workers, uh, the mental health uh, uh, workers, and have liaisons who are able to understand by discussions with our pediatric colleagues how they can transition these parents as well. And I think uh, databases and uh, uh, ongoing research has to be accomplished in order uh, to understand uh, what we're really doing and how to do it right. So getting back to the, the uh, real topic that we're going to discuss uh, is the abnormal pediatric uh, bladder. And by that I mean a bladder that is diseased from day one. And what's, what's going to happen with these patients? Are they a ticking time bomb? This is a patient uh, who's one of our Seattle patients who uh, you can see has a big, thick uh, bladder. And, uh, t and the, the area encircled by the green, I'm not sure if you can see the green very well, is a big mass. This patient had had cystoscopy and cytology were normal. He's a valve patient who had a kidney transplant, and that mass was biopsied at lap laparotomy and came back as showing adenocarcinoma. So Mike Mitchell, while he was in Seattle, did 72 gastrocystoplasties, and two of the patients, um, uh, develop metastatic adenocarcinoma within 15 years of their uh, placement uh, of the uh, augmentation. So there's now a moratorium, uh, to put it bluntly, on gastrocystoplasty. As a matter of fact, most augmentation cystoplasties uh, in Seattle. But if you take a look at the, the specifics of the two patients who developed adenocarcinoma, one was a myelomeningocele. Uh, the patient had a metrophenoff and a gastrocystoplasty, had, had annual cystoscopies, which were negative, and presented with liver metastases and lymph node metastases. Uh, urine cytology came back positive in this patient, uh, but there was no suspicion ahead of time, and there were no lesions seen on cystoscopy. The patient whose x-rays I showed you had valves, had a gastrocystoplasty and metrophenoff, a living-related uh, transplant seven years previously, had been followed closely um, medically with annual ultrasounds and started presenting with new onset hydronephrosis. Cystoscopy was done, nothing seen in the bladder uh, whatsoever, uh, and then he started losing weight and the CT scan was done, and that's what showed the mass that was ultimately uh, discovered on laparotomy. So basically there's several objectives, and uh, we're going to talk about the abnormal pediatric uh, bladder and perhaps screening uh, and understand that augmentation per se is only one of the factors that uh, may be involved with the development of bladder cancer and actually intermittent catheterization and the trauma that's associated with it may be even a little bit worse than, than augmentation and the two together um, uh, tend to act synergistically to promote the development of tumors. When I was in um, Boston, my chairman, Ben Giddes, was one of the first to, to use the uh, RAT model and look at um, adenocarcinoma in patients who underwent ureterosigmoidoscopy. And at that time, we had a huge patient population at Boston Children's Hospital that Angie Arachlis, one of the pediatric surgeons, reported on who had de developed uh, uh, adenocarcinomas at the site of the ureter to colon anastomosis. And it was thought that there was a huge increase in cancer uh, in these patients. It was hypothesized by Dr. Giddes that this was due uh, to nitrites in the fecal uh, uh, urine mixture. Uh, and basically, uh, ureterosig, as a, as a result, became less and less utilized in patients with extrophy of the bladder. Well, we know that other patients who have adult abnormal bladders, those with schistosomiasis and tuberculosis, so they have damaged, inflamed uh, bladders, are also predisposed to cancer, as are patients who have had radiation. So the question is, is there an increase to cancer following augmentation for congenital blad bladder abnormalities? And there are risk factors that we're adding to the system. There's urinary stasis, pH 
uh, ch uh, uh, changes, nitrites and nitrosamines, infections, calculi, uh, foreign bodies, fresh anastomotic lines, uh, and the ongoing tra trauma of instrumentation. When we look at uh, uh, congenital bladder dysfunction, there is an increase of adenocarcinoma that we know in the extra feed population, whether they're augmented or not, and this has been defined over the years. The neurogenic bladder patients, however, it's been controversial as to whether they're at increased of uh, malignancy or not. So is bladder augmentation an independent risk factor? And is there an inherent risk of malignancy even in patients who have abnormal bladders who uh, aren't or who are augmented? So we take a look at the literature and looking at several reports, you can see here that there there's uh, 13 cases uh, of uh, adenocarcinoma, and one adenoma is polyps and ileal and colon cotton augments. And knowing that we've only done gastrocystoplasty in North America for roughly 20 years, there's almost as many cases in that small population who have undergone gastrocystoplasty. So Sorgal and colleagues who were in, uh, looking at Mike Mitchell and Rick Rink's patients from Indianapolis had three patients who had sequel and ileocecal augmentation, all died, and based on this, they recommended these, uh, the patients who had been augmented uh, undergo annual cystoscopy and screening 10 years after uh, augmentation. Castellan, again, showed three other patients, all with gastric uh, cystoplasties, interestingly, all alive at follow-up uh, 23 months, and they too recommended yearly cystos and screening for bladder cancer starting 10 years after a gastrocystoplasty. Well, if we look at the University of Iowa series, and the unique thing uh, uh, about Iowa, it's very similar to a Canadian center in a way. It's a, a central university where all the tertiary and quaternary cases in the state are referred to, so they're the central depository for complex uh, care. And this is a, a, from a paper that uh, Chris Austin published before he moved to uh, Oregon, but they looked at a 10-year period and they had 10 patients, eight females, two males, who had uh, myelomeningocils and developed bladder cancer at a mean age of 37. Now, it's important to look at how they presented because these are things that we're going to address towards the end of the lecture as to how we might screen or identify higher risk populations. But the presentation, if you look at the 10 patients, were primarily with, with something new, gross hematuria, a change in cathing that became more difficult, more uh, urinary tract infections, in particular febrile urinary tract infections, and continued sterile pyuria rather than having bacteriuria. If you looked at these 10 patients, you can see it's a mixed pathology. 60% had tr transitional cells, 20% had squamous cells. The stage was high stage in uh, all but one of the patients with lymph nodes being positive of 40%. The treatment was all across uh, uh, the board, uh, as you can see. <clears throat> and if we take a look, the median survival was only 15 months, and only one patient with T2N0 disease was alive and disease-free at 20 months, and one patient was alive with liver metastases at eight months. Interestingly, six of the 10 had had regular yearly visits with a urologist, and uh, on those visits had a minimum of a urinalysis, lab studies, and ultrasound. Only two of the ten had had bladder augmentation, but all were on intermittent catheterization. So the only common feature other than having myelomeningocele was CIC in these patients. And uh, looking at the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that the survival analysis is pretty dismal in, uh, in this group. It was advanced disease and uh, uh, within two years, 81% uh, were dead. If we take a look at this uh, compilation of all the patients in the literature that I've been able to find uh, who have been diagnosed uh, with, with um, uh, cancers after various uh, augmentations. So uh, <clears throat> Bruce Filmer and Julie, Julie Spencer Barthold, as well as others since then, have recommended that there is an assumed increase in the risk of uh, bladder cancer in patients who have undergone augmentation. And we know that they do it pre present uh, <clears throat> uh, clandestinely almost at an advanced stage. So the, when do we start to evaluate them and screen? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Is it annually? Uh, 
Should we do cytology? Should we do cystoscopy? Should we do radiology? All of the above? Some of the above. So it's pretty vague as to uh, what we're supposed to do. I don't know how many of you were at the AUA last year, but uh, Doug Hoosman did a, a plenary uh, uh, session and they presented a few new papers with their long-term data, again realizing the faults and strength of a place like Mayo where it's uh, really a uh, uh, referral center for the world and they have a unique referral bias obviously that comes to that institution. But they look, looked at uh, their patients since 1986. They had 385 patients in a prospective database uh, who had undergone augmentation cystoplasty. And they specifically looked at those who had been followed for more than 10 years post-augment, about 150 patients, and some patients were greater than 50 years after uh, their augment. So they were really in the first group who underwent augmentation cystoplasty. Some had had undiversions from ileal conduits uh, uh, back to their native uh, bladder. And basically, uh, this is how the patients uh, broke down. Most of them had ileal augments, two-thirds of them and 44 had colon uh, uh, augments. You can see that, uh, again, two-thirds were neurogenic patients and uh, roughly twice as many extra fee epispadius patients as opposed to posterior retro valve patients. So the median follow-up in this group was uh, 27 years with a minimum follow-up of 10 up to 53 uh, years. And they found that about 4.5% or 7 of the 153 developed a malignancy, which was a risk uh, ratio of about 1.5% per decade post-augment. Pretty small numbers. If we take a look at the neurogenic population in and of itself, uh, <clears throat> which uh, uh, there were 2% or 2 of the 97 patients developed cancer, it was all transitional cell cancer, and interestingly, both of the patients had been significant uh, tobacco uh, users, uh, which we know obviously is a factor involved in bladder cancer. They had widespread mucosal involvement, and uh, both of the patients had cystectomy and ileal conduits, no evidence of disease at five or six years postoperatively, so they did fairly well in that group. In the extra fee patient, 8% of them, or 3 out of 39, uh, d developed uh, malignancy, predominantly adenocarcinoma, widespread in the cancers involved not only the bladder itself but the augment in all of the patients, um, and it was metastatic in diagnosis in only one of the patients. Again, cystectomy and uh, chondroit were the preferred modes of therapy in this group, and uh, uh, one of the patients was uh, dead already. Uh, the small number of patients with valves, two of them, or 12%, developed malignancy. Both of the patients, interestingly, uh, <clears throat> had had renal transplants and developed viral cystitis. So they looked at this as a real um, uh, risk factor, and the tumors, in their opinion, arose in the augment themselves. So they were treated by cystectomy, stopping immunosuppressive, and both the patients were dead of disease. When we take a look then and put this all together, the cancer in the enteric bladder augment population, the risk of malignancy was 1.5% per decade. It was advanced disease at diagnosis, 70% of them being T3, 4, and 1 patients. And they defined a group that were high-risk patients. The tobacco uh, uh, exposure, uh, the transplant patient who was on immunosuppressants and also developed uh, secondary infections with viral cystitis, and alone by itself, the extra fee population uh, is an independent risk factor. So we're really not augmenting a normal population to begin with. They're all on intermittent catheterization. They're all on have bacteriuria. They all have repeated trauma of catheterization. We're hitting them with different medications and bug juices, many of which are concentrated uh, in the urine and sitting there with dwell time in the bladder, and we don't know what effects that they may have. So the Mayo group also decided to look at augment as an independent risk factor. So they compared their patients with abnormal bladders who required intermittent catheterization, which they termed dysfunctional bladders, and compared them to the CIC group uh, that were augmented. So they had the 153 patients with augments, and over the same period of time, they had 
589 patients with dysfunctional non-augmented bladders that were on uh, intermittent uh, catheterization. And if you take a look at the cause of the bladder dysfunction, it was pretty well matched compared to what the numbers I showed you, two-thirds being neurogenic and twice as many extropy patients as valve patients. Unfortunately, from their, uh, liter their search of their database, they, they hadn't put in the database tobacco usage, so they couldn't uh, uh, <clears throat> differentiate with that, and they, had no fam uh, they didn't have the ability to go back and get a good history of, fam of uh, family history of bladder cancer or industrial exposures. So if you take a look at this population, Getting back to the group we just discussed, the augmentation in CIC, 4.5% with a median time to tumor of 32 years. The bladder dysfunction group with CIC alone, a little bit less than 2.6% or half of, of, of um, what the other uh, groups show with <clears throat> the median age of diagnosis of uh, 50 years. So if you take a look at the incidence of malignancy falling uh, the, the enterocystoplasty versus uh, match controls, you can see this on the graphs, that they tend to follow one another pretty much the same way along these curves. If we look at bladder augmentation then as an independent risk fa factor for cancer, there's a six to seven fold increase in those who have been augmented and undergo CIC. In those who have CIC alone, it's half that three to four uh, increase and there's not a statistically significant difference, believe it or not, between the normal population when compared to the control population. But if you compare the normal population to the augment plus CIC, it just reaches uh, uh, statistical significance, but just by a hair. So again, we know that there's multiple uh, stimuli. We've talked about those already, the trauma, the bacteriuria. Are we gonna improve things by by trying to artificially change the bladder using tissue engineered uh, bladders. And we're part of the TENGENS uh, study, which is Tony Atala's group, looking at, at the uh, bla um, uh, <clears throat> tissue engineered bladder, and we've opted not to, to do it based on a lot of, uh, of the early results that we've heard in camera, and also to my own feelings about what's happening with these patients. My feelings are is we're harvesting abnormal native cells. We're taking from the extrophy bladder, from the, uh, from the uh, neurogenic bladder or the valve bladder. We're growing these on scaffolds and we're adding growth factors, which we don't know what their true influence is. We're putting them back into the same hostile environment that's still gonna require CIC. We're not gonna have the neural impulses and everything else that we have for our own bladders and the same myogenic control and we don't know what the uh, impact is of mutagenesis uh, uh, given all these other cofactors. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to really embrace uh, the new technology, uh, at least uh, the way it stands right now. So getting back to this slide that I showed earlier, should we really survey these patients and what is the best way to survey them uh, if we're gonna do so? If we survey them, will we really find the cancers that we're looking for and will we find them at the right time or will it be like this situation? Will, we know, will it be there right in front of our faces or behind our bottoms and uh, uh, we still can't identify uh, where they might be? Especially when we realize that there's a relatively low incidence of cancers occurring. So with bowel alone, 4.2%, twice as many in the gastrocystoplasty. And re remembering what I just showed you with the data, the gastrocystoplasty population, two of four had a cysto within a year of their diagnosis of metastatic disease. And in the Iowa series, six of 10 were followed regularly by a urologist. So are we gonna have to increase to even more healthcare dollars uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to be able to uh, screen these patients and what's the benefit? Well, let's go back again. When I was a resident uh, in Boston, uh, the Boston VA Hospital, we had a huge spinal cord injury unit, and it was the first uh, <clears throat> institution to publish on the increased risk of squamous cell cancer uh, uh, of the bladder in patients who had indwelling suprapubic tubes for their neurogenic bladder. And so it was recommended in that group, and we spent two clinics every week just cystoing these patients looking for bladder tumors. Every one of these VA spinal cord patients from the East Coast 
would come in every year, we'd sisto, we'd sisto, we'd sisto, and uh, uh, go on and on. But if you take a look at the long term, looking at that cohort and many others that have been um, evaluated in the literature, what the screen studies do is very similar to what we talked about in Wilms tumor last night. You may identify these patients at a lower stage, but it's not uh, cost effective. And the cost effective in the United States is defined as something that costs less than $50,000 in order to prevent one uh, fatality. So let's try to look, that, look at that logic in patients who, um, who uh, <clears throat> might be prone to cancers from the, with the abnormal pediatric uh, population. So here's 50, just think of 50 patients uh, for five years. If we do, uh, these are patients who have been evaluated at the Mayo Clinic and urine cytology was positive in 26 uh, of 250 specimens in the, that population with a specificity of 90% and an un unknown sensitivity. They were also cystoscoped, and only one of these patients <clears throat> had a suspicious lesion. So again, remembering the data that I showed you that the tumor incidence is 1.5% per decade, we know that the cytology it has, poor spe well, it has poor specificity with unknown sensitivity, and it's fairly costly. It's about $460 per specimen with little proven benefit, especially in the patient with chronic inflammation. Cystoscopy, uh, uh, it's required to do over 950 to diagnose one malignancy with the hope that you will see it uh, uh, while it's clinically evident at a cost of $625 per cystoscopy in the United States. Pretty good bucks, huh? <laughs> so when you put that all together, looking at all those numbers, the estimated cost is about $950,000 in order to diagnose one case of bladder cancer, and the question by diagnosing that case, will you be able to prevent death from occurring? So, are, mm -hmm. uh, how do you do it on here? What, what do I hear? So I don't know if the, uh, uh, those of you are, who are being teleconferenced heard that, but Andrew asked uh, what are the, the costs looking at, at these costs with prostate cancer screening in order to, to save one life. So what, what is the answer? You have to screen 1,400 patients. Yeah. And treat 48 extra. And to treat 48 extra in order to save one life. Where do you get that data from? So why are we treating prostate cancer at all? You can say that because Mary's not. Okay. <laughs> we'll go on then. Um, so are the clues, that, again, giving that cost, that indicate a need for endoscopy, and, and is there a higher risk uh, group? Um, well, the, if we look closely at the literature, many of the patients will have a radiologic change. Uh, there's been a clinical change in that, uh, if we look at some of these populations, there's a higher incidence of new onset gross hematuria, more symptomatic urinary tract infections, and the new onset after many years of, of pain in the area uh, of the neobladder. Uh, so the consensus has been, at least with, us, with many of us who, who see these kids and have had big stables of this population, is if there's more than one of these abnormalities, the patients at least require at least an endoscopy, if not a CT scan, which is much more efficient in this population than an ultrasound is. So, if the history is positive, more, more than four symptomatic infections a year, CT scan and cystoscopy, uh, and especially if it's associated with new onset hematuria, pelvic pain, uh, I think there's going to be a higher yield. Again, it's still going to require dozens and dozens of multicenter trials and probably a collaboration where we have one central database before we're going to learn more about this population. <laughs> 
If the history is uh, negative, most of these patients, because they're being followed up for their neurogenic bladder, are going to have uh, uh, blood studies. And at least in my hands, they get a KUB looking for stones and an ultrasound every year anyway. And I'm not sure what you do with uh, the patients who have had abnormal um, um, issues. And if I see a new change uh, that, that wasn't there before, then I'm going to be pushed more to, to do cystoscopy in that population. Uh, this was a paper again from the Mayo Clinic group looking at uh, colon augmentation because if you look at the earlier augments uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was more of an emphasis on using the large bowel than the small bowel. And we've got to remember that the population in general, in general, all of us are at risk of colon cancer. That's why we start having colonoscopies at the age of, of uh, 50. So the question then becomes, in that group alone, the ones that we've used colon on, once they reach that age group, will that translate to being, um, those patients be more prone to develop cancers that they would have had in their colon anyway? So should they have a colonoscopy as well as a cystoscopy at the same time? So they should be screened just like we do and possibly even more frequently uh, than at-risk patients who reach the age of 50 and we're trying to look at uh, colon cancer. Another group that's a high-risk population are those clearly who have been on immunosuppressives and had a transplant. And these have all been valve patients to date, so especially the valve patients who have had these and then have new onset viral cystitis, uh, they're at a much higher risk of developing uh, cancer. Uh, when we look at the extra fee epispadius group, the highest risk population is probably those who have had an undiversion from a ureterosig uh, to, to their current situation, but in and of itself, uh, extra fee is a much higher risk population than the others, but we still wouldn't advocate ongoing cystoscopy unless they had some of the symptoms or changes in the ultrasound. I think gastric augments is something that's still involving because our history and our knowledge of augments uh, using the stomach is not great enough. So we have to follow them a little bit more uh, closely. We know that in patients who have their stomach in situ and have uh, atrophic gastritis, that they're more prone to developing gastric cancer. So the question is, is if we biopsy the, uh, patients um, who have been augmented with stomach and they have a premalignant condition, um, do we have to follow them more closely as well? And will that risk be the same in patients who have composite grafts where we use smaller portions of uh, the stomach and we buffer them with ileum? Probably is not going to change anything. And, and I, I think, again, it's a high-risk group that there's so few of them that we really don't, we won't be able to ever uh, identify that group even with a good database. So the patients with enteric augments can develop cancer. The risk is low, 1.5%. Per decade, it's a six to seven fold increase over uh, the normal population over the first six decades of life. However, it's, uh, that number is only twice what we'd expect in, in uh, age matched uh, and etiology matched controls who, who are on CIC alone. And the augment itself doesn't significantly increase that risk. So it does from the norm, but it doesn't when you compare CIC alone to CIC plus augment. So we have to, again, realize that tobacco usage, immunosuppression, and viral cystitis, extrophy, especially with fecal soiling, and uh, gastric augmentations are all separate concerns. So there is a balance, and this is a problem. Uh, but I, at the same time, I think we have to temper our responses and not overreact to a situation. And we have to. Uh, really not underestimate the social good that we've done for many of these patients and uh, what's happened with their own self-esteem and social interactions. Um, Terry Hensley used to have a great slide that I never converted to PowerPoint, but he had a picture of a, a patient uh, prior to non-diversion with a bag and on his abdomen he wrote with a felt marker, I don't think you could do this today, but, but life with a bag is a drag. And, um, you know, when we were doing all these uh, um, undiversions in the 80s and early 90s, you've never seen a happier population when they got rid of their bag, especially the ones who weren't, didn't have multiple abnormalities. So the valve patients 
the patients, many patients with reflux had ileal conduits in the old days, and, and you converted them back and used their own bladders, and they were a different person afterwards. Mark Kane, who um, uh, is at Indiana, and uh, Mark Twain clearly had some sage observations, and I think Mark Kane also stated this beautifully, that this is something that we have to communicate to our colleagues in adult urology as well as the other uh, specialties. And clearly we do need multi-institutional prospective studies and, and large databases if we're going to learn anything about this problem in the long run. So this is a complex group of patients who half a century ago had a high mortality rate and poor quality of life. Our goals are perfection. I mean, we're reconstructive urologists and we want to do what's best for our patients. Uh, our initial goals are to preserve renal status and ultimately secondarily to obtain social continence. So we have to do it with, 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 with an armamentarium that's changing. The, the ileal loop and colon loop were the norm in the 1970s. 30 years later, the bulk of these patients are going on to um, uh, continent reservoirs or, or augmentation cystoplasties. We're seeing changes in transplant protocols. When I did my transplant fellowship, cyclosporin was first coming out. So we've, we've changed in this high-risk population is becoming much lower risk, but now we're identifying newer problems as they're living beyond their past life expectancy. So we have to ask ourselves when we see a problem like cancer developing, what is the true price of progress and facing the unforeseen as we learn about the problems that we're creating as this population base enjoys a more fruitful life and more longevity. And as John Kennedy said, it's only those who dare to fail greatly that can ever achieve greatly. So with that, I'll, I'll end and open the floor to discussion.